Righto, off we go. Well, we're here. Well done. Thank you. Ian, Professor Ian Plymer, uh, geologist, uh, professor, uh, media superstar, children's book author now are here. Tell us about the children's book that's just a, as a kickoff. I'm very intrigued by this. Well, my concern is that the teachers have got the kids at our schools, converting them into lefties, uh, giving them information which is not valid, and these kids uh, end up being... Um, rather depressed about the world they're taught them. And and the world isn't like that. The world's a wonderful place. So the first book uh, out of the trilogy is for ankle biters. And this is for kids about seven or eight or so. And I go into the carbon cycle and carbon dioxide and climate change. Well, how the hell do you get those concepts over to a seven or eight-year-old? So I think of what my kids were like and what my grandkids were like. So this book is written around the carbon cycle using poo, uh, farts, we, uh, boogers and and uh, earwax and all of those are carbon compounds, all of those are a way of your body getting rid of carbon and recycling carbon. So I I write it mainly around farts and the chemistry <laughs> farts are really quite interesting and um, trying to teach kids that, you know, if they want to be the fart champion of the school, this is a diet you should have. And you know. It's doing a great disservice and, to parents everywhere. Well, this, this book is for parents yeah. and for grandparents yeah. to actually read to their kids. But it's, it's a bit of a change, isn't it? Because, I mean, you have actually written, in fact, the, my first introduction to you was the book Not For Greens, which was a book that you wrote. And that was probably second or third in line of the books you've written, but it was just spoke to me because you, you, you proffered the concept that if we listen to the Australian Greens, we would not even be able to get a teaspoon yes, to stir and, and our coffee. that concept I bring up again with the kids in this book for seven or eight-year-olds. I bring it up again in the book for 14-year-olds, which is for tweens and teens, and I go into a little bit more detail, and I use what teenagers often say, oh, that's not fair. And so I go into fairness. You know, why is it that Kids your age are getting killed working underground in the mines of the Congo to provide cobalt for electric cars. Is that fair? Yeah. If if you like electric cars, you're actually killing kids your age. And so I, I, I bring a moral twist to that. And then the third one, which I'm just finishing off, um, is for 20s and wrinklies. And that looks at the long history of the planet. And this long history of the planet I put in layman's talk. This is a watered down first year lectures that I would give. And this is showing that the planet has had massive climate changes, that we've had ice ages when the carbon dioxide content has been hundreds of times higher than now. So it's obvious that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere couldn't drive climate change. And I conclude that the evidence is overwhelming. And then I go into, well, why are you being fed this when it's so obviously wrong? Now, there are not many geologists around in the world. Uh, most geologists are employed out in the bush in some exciting part of the world. They don't get a chance to sit around and go to demonstrations and moan and groan and be on social media. So uh, we, we're a small group of people, but we actually look at the past to try to understand what's happening in the present. Now, if you say, oh, that's just geology, what you're really saying is that the laws of physics and chemistry don't work in the past. They only work in your life. Now, that's just ridiculous. So that book is also aimed at younger people, but also at parents and at grandparents. So this trilogy is being launched at the CPAC conference in Sydney on the 19th of August, Saturday the 19th we launch it, and I'll be there signing away. And um, CPAC, by the way, is the uh, Conservative Political Alliance Conference uh, Australia, which is uh, held annually. It's a great event. I go every year now, and so do you. So Yes, and, and it's an offshoot <coughs> from the American CPAC. Mm which has unknowns like Donald Trump talk and these sorts of things. Uh, and it, it's stuff. basically a group of people talking about morals and values. Right. Uh, what do we conservatives stand for? We stand for the truth. Now, what kids are being taught now at school is not true. And they're being asked to write essays about how we're all going to fry and die due to sinful emissions of carbon dioxide. And a lot of the kids know that that's not true. Yet they write the essay and they get their marks. And the kids have learned that if I want to pass this subject, I have to tell lies. So we're actually um, in a situation with no morality in what we teach our kids. 
and that frightened me. Is that, is that new? I, mean, I remember that uh, even going through university in the 90s, uh, school a little bit, there, there felt like there was a narrative that you needed to adopt in order. Is that worse now, do you think? Oh, or? far worse, yeah. yes. Yes, far worse. And um, I think that has all happened uh, since 1968. And I think we had a change in the Western world in 1968, and these were the great student revolutions of France. And the whole of the left then started its great march in Western countries. And if you've been educated after 1968, you've had various intensities of of, of leftism pushed onto you. And in the 90s, you were lucky. But kids today do not get a chance. Didn't work Um, for me. They are being told to go out in in the paddocks and milk the bull. I mean, this is a sort of ridiculous um, gender idiocy they're being taught. Uh, They're not taught in biology that you can tell from the bone structure what is a male and what is a female. Uh, This is how we know from fossil humans uh, that these were males and females. We know from the footprints of fossil humans who evolved very quickly once it got cold and when it got warm they got a bit lazy and they had plenty of food. We can tell from the footprint which footprint was a male, which was a female. We can tell from the skeleton how there were skeletal changes to accommodate the larger brain that humans were evolving uh, and the I thought, rather I, I plastic... thought you were going to say men. Yeah. <laughs> Larger brains for men. <laughs> and and the, the plastic skull such that you could actually give birth to a child. Yeah. And so these are quite fascinating interrelationships. And this is something I have argued passionately about for some time is the coherence criterion of science. If you were saying that we had no uh, medieval warming, that's got to be in accord with history. That's got to be in accord with what we see from astronomy. That's got to be in accord with isotope chemistry. It isn't. There was a medieval warming. Michael Mann and others wanted to kill it off, but there was a medieval warming. So the coherence criterion of science is if you have an idea, it's got to be in accord with all the other data that's validated from other fields. And this is where global warming falls apart. It is not in accord with a basic science called geology. And in geology, we use biology, we use physics, in geophysics, for example, chemistry and geochemistry. We use all different disciplines to put together a story and we test it. And we test it by looking for minerals and by looking for energy. And the very fact that we find these mineral deposits and find energy means that we've got the theory right. Now, climate science doesn't do this. In climate science, you create a model and there have been more than 100 created. They've been around for 40 years or so and we've shown over the last 40 years, by measurement, comparing that to a model, that the models just don't work. They're hopelessly wrong. And so you can look back in the past to tell you what's happening at present. Now, all of our climate hysteria, all of the political policy is based on model, not based on measurement. And if I've got a choice, would I take a measurement or would I take a model? What am I going to take? And that's what we're left with when we analyse the basis of this so-called science called climate science. The measurements are sometimes not even right either. We were talking as we walked in about the the Bureau, the Bureau of Meteorology and their homogenising of data. People don't know this, but uh, Senator Gerard Rennick prosecutes this one at estimates every year and gets the same stonewalling from the department. But just step us through that because I think people will be quite shocked to learn about the homogenisation of temperature. In science, you argue. You argue with your friends, and if you argue too hard or argue from emotion, you will lose them as friends. But you argue on the basis of data. Now, we will collect data, and the question you have to ask is, what was the equipment you used? What was the order of accuracy? What measurements did you accept, and what measurements did you reject? Now, in the case of carbon dioxide measurements, they are done by using infrared spectroscopy, measuring infrared rays going through the air. Now, there's interference from water vapour, and so you've got to take that out, and there's um, interference um, from equipment, drifts and errors. Previously, we used to measure carbon dioxide with bucket chemistry, getting a bucket of air and precipitating out carbonate, telling you how much carbon dioxide was in the air. Now, when we got rid of that very expensive bucket chemistry measurement and used infrared, we never have an overlap of the methods. It was just topped and tailed. So we couldn't compare one with the other. So when you look at the old measurements of carbon dioxide, they're up and down and up and down and up and down, even higher than now. And when you look at the new ones, it's a very, very smooth curve. Now, as a scientist, I get worried about a smooth curve. 
something's wrong. So um, that's the first thing. How did you measure it? And it was with equipment, which is not in accord with previous equipment. The second thing is who did it and where was it done? Well, it's done on a mountain in Hawaii, and that mountain is a volcano emitting carbon dioxide, yet you're emitting carbon dioxide. Down at the bottom of the mountain are roads and towns where traffic is emitting carbon dioxide. So you've got a, an, an error straight away. The third thing is that about 90% of the numbers are rejected. I want to know why. Did these not fit your theory? Did the equipment go on the blink? And if it went on the blink then, would it go on the blink with the ones you accepted? So that's with carbon dioxide. Now with temperature, we measure temperature a number of ways. We can measure it by proxy, looking at what ancient temperatures were, and then not nearly as accurate as modern temperature measurements, but proxies are measuring uh, processes of the past. And you can work out the temperature of the poles very easily. You can work out the temperature of the surface of the ocean. And you can get that to about a tenth of a degree Celsius. Now, proxies tell us about what happened up until about the mid-1600s. And from then on, we had a measuring station in central England. That hasn't moved and they haven't changed the instruments. And that measuring station for the last 300 years has shown there has been no global warming. And since the 1850s, we've started to use mercury thermometers. And mercury thermometers in the measurements since the 1850s show that we've had three periods of warming and two of cooling. Yet the growth trend is that of warming. So you look at that growth trend and you say, oh, we've had warming. And you look at the carbon dioxide emissions and they're totally unrelated to the warming. And the second thing is the three warming events have got the same um, gradient, which means that it's the same process, which means that carbon dioxide is not driving it. And the third thing is, if carbon dioxide does drive temperature, how come you've got these two cooling periods? And then how do you fit that in with what's really happening? Because in 1850, when we started these measurements, we were coming out of the Little Ice Age. And what's going to happen after the Little Ice Age? Are you going to cook or are you, or, or are you going to get cold? What's going to happen? What's going to warm up? But if you look at it over a longer scale you get a very different story. Temperature is up and down. And we have been cooling down for the last 50 million years. We are currently in an ice age. We've been here for 34 million years. And during that ice age, the temperature goes up when we're close to the sun, and the temperature goes down when we're further away. And these cycles, we've measured. And if you want to argue that it's carbon dioxide that drives temperature, you have to get rid of the rotation of the Earth. You have to change it. You can't do it by legislation. You can't do it by changing the rules of physics. And what we find is that we have just come out of a very interesting period. We had a, an interglacial between 116 and 128,000 years ago, and then we started to cool down. And there were three hominid species on planet Earth then. There was the uh, Homo uh, florensis, the hobbits from Indonesia, and there were the Neanderthals, and there was us. About 70,000 years ago, in this cooling trend in the glaciation, we had a dirty big volcano, Toba in Indonesia, a super volcano. It filled the atmosphere with dust, and the tropical forests died. People migrated north and south. That's when we had the first Aboriginals come into this country. And we were down to about 4,000 breeding pairs. Now, the Neanderthals became extinct, Hobbits became extinct, we very nearly became extinct also. And we got to the peak of our ice age, our last ice age, about 20,000 years ago, and we started to come into our interglacial 14,700 years ago, and about 7,000 to 4,000 years ago, we were at the peak of our interglacial. And for the last 4,000 years, we'd been cooling. And in that cooling trend, we've had warming spikes and cooling spikes. So if some clown asks you, um, are we warming? Um, it's the wrong question to ask because you all you can do is to say, since when? We've been warming since the medieval, uh, since the last um, cool period called the Little Ice Age. We've been cooling since the medieval warming. We've been warming since the Dark Ages. We've been cooling since the time of Jesus. So when? 
But it's, it's, it's like I remember once, uh, not that I followed any of the advice, but a, but a stockbroker said to me, you can't look at the markets over a six month period. You've got to look at them in a 20 year period. The trend is your friend. The trend is your friend is yes. exactly what it is. And that, that is exactly the point. I think that's lost on politicians because politicians are very three year orientated. Um, there is this uh, inability in politics. I find it in, in parliament all the time to rise above that that, that narrative and it is, it, it's like walking into an alternate universe where people are just have adopted this orthodoxy, the media's adopted it, and we keep hearing this line, 97% of scientists agree. Now, that is one of the greatest misstatements of the modern era. Tell us why. Well, I haven't finished answering the previous question, which I'll come <laughs> back to. Um, a comment first on politicians. Most politicians are concerned about getting re-elected. Right. And they are not concerned about the welfare of the nation. They're not concerned about the long-term future of our nation. And um, this gets down to pre-selection. Who are we going to pre-select? Who are those who um, perhaps don't need a parliamentary salary to survive? And as we had in former times in the 19th century, people who'd made their money went into politics. And on one issue, they might be voting with their mate on the next issue, they're voting against them. Yeah. And they were um, people who were comfortable enough to be able to say, the world's been good to me, it's time for me to give it something back. So politics is now a career. It's not a calling. And there are a few exceptions. You're one of them. Um, Matt Canavan's another one of them. Uh, Keith Pitt. Um, they're pretty well all on the conservative side. Um, or I think we have a Labor senator here who's, who treats it as a calling. Uh, Don Farrell, but um, there are very few politicians who view it as a long-term building of the nation. Yeah. So uh, we have huge problems, I think, with that. The second thing is that they're always looking over their shoulder to get a vote here and get a vote there. And the conservative politics uh, politicians of Australia shouldn't worry about getting green votes because the Greens will never vote for them anyway. So why bother? Mm. Uh, why even count out to the Greens? I mean, why... why have a, a splash of red in, in your um, prospectus. Just go for what are principles and morally good for the country. Mm. Now, in terms of the 97%, this is misleading and deceptive. <laughs> there was a sociologist who did a survey of about 10,000 climate scientists. Now, I question the word scientist because these are people who are eminently unemployable, <laughs> except if they're working in the Climate Institute or university or CSIRO or something. And he, he put a survey out to 10,000. 3,000 of them deemed to answer it. Mm. And he then chose 77 of the replies. And out of those 77, 76 said, yes, yes, we humans are destroying the planet and cooking it up. One said no. And that's how you got the 97.1% figure. And this was tweeted by Barack Obama. Yes, and there is a lot in the literature, especially by a chap called David Legatis, who's a mathematician, who's just torn this apart. Mm. But you never hear that. Mm. You only hear that 97% figure. Now, I like that 97% figure because I would argue that 97% of uh, scientists will agree with uh, those who pay them, <laughs> and that's what we're seeing. Mm. Now, if <clears throat> the science was settled, then why should we have climate scientists? Why should we pay them any more? They've done yeah. their job. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Go away. Yeah. Now, many people, <clears throat> and I'm one of them, have contracts whereby once you've done your job, you're sacked. You're out of work. Um, you've done your job. Your, your brief is to do this. When you finish it, you've done it. Now, if the science is settled, go away. <laughs> now, these people uh, will use what they publish with the PAL review. It's not peer review. Uh, and they will um, make sure that there's still more work to be done, more scares to be um, put out there. So <clears throat> having published about 140 scientific papers in my life, I know how the peer review process works. I've reviewed many papers, many theses. I've been editor of major journals. It is a PAL review process. Mm. If you want to kill a scientist's life, you will send that manuscript to that reviewer. If you want that paper to get up and be published, you send it to that reviewer. Yeah. We all know how that system works. And this works especially in the climate business <clears throat> because they're not that many people mm. and they're all mates. And so when you have something like the Bureau of Meteorology that makes measurements and says we're all going to fry and die, then no climate uh, person is going to criticise that. Yet they know 
that we've had measuring stations out there for more than 100 years, especially in rural Australia. And what's happened is the Bureau of Meteorology has looked at the trend and has cooled the older results to make it look as if we've got a warming trend. Mm. Now, in some areas, such as in central city Melbourne or at airports, the measuring stations are right within traffic or where you're getting back reflection off roads or exhaust fumes or whatever, and there has to be a correction called the urban heat island effect. And we, and we argue a lot about whether that correction is valid. But we have many rural stations, like at Rutherglen or at Burke, or, that are giving us a long-term record showing us that the Bureau of Meteorology has actually cooked the books. Now, we pay them a million dollars a day. We don't pay them a million dollars a day to cook the books. We pay them a million dollars a day to give us the primary data. And then they can interpret that the way they want to. But the primary data is not available. And Jennifer Marahassi has spent a lot of her life with freedom of information requests trying to get that primary data. She's had a little bit of a dribble, but in effect, the numbers we are getting from a taxpayer-paid organisation are unreliable. And they are being used to set major policy decisions that have an effect on one or two generations' time. That's not science. Yeah. That's propaganda. I mean, this is a, the peer review process that you describe uh, is, is actually true in medical journals as well. I mean, it, presumably it's the same. People put a lot of stock in this peer review system, uh, but it's fallible. Like all humans are fallible. Like the science is fallible. Um, where's it coming from? Like, you know, is this just... You know, people will tell you it's a it's a global push. It's a, there's a trend. It's a cultural issue, but it does feel like um, there is more dishonesty in public discourse than there has ever been in times gone by. Eisenhower, in his departing address, warned us that if science is funded by government, then government will get the answers they want. Yeah. And the implication being is that scientists, to, to keep a job, uh, will be uh, basically. Um, unemployed. Now, I'm one of those scientists who can work in industry and can work in a university. I've, I've worked in universities in two phases of my life and in industry in two phases of my life, but I'm one of the few. Most of the scientists who are working <coughs> in government-funded organisations or taxpayer-funded organisations are unable to get work outside those organisations. So if the government says, um, this is our policy, you will find the science to support it. Now, for many years, I sat on the Australian Research Council with the late and great Bob Carter, and we went to every research institution in this country, um, assessing their research and uh, giving decisions on research grant applications. I also sat in the German Research Council, and I also sat in the Swedish Research Council. Now, at the time when Minister John Dawkins, a Labor Minister, <coughs> was the Education Minister, a Science Minister, he um, insisted that we have a war on cancer. So if you could show in your research that by digging a hole with a left-handed shovel um, was a, a method of reducing cancer, mm. you would get funded. Yeah. Now, we have exactly the same now in the Australian Research Council and other research councils around the world. If you can show that ingrown toenails are a result of climate change, you will get funded for it. And so we've had a total, absolute corruption of science rather than having science driven by curiosity yeah. and rather than having science driven by people trying to solve problems. The very best science I did was when I was working in the mining industry and there <clears throat> I had no controls, no one um, would review any paper that I wrote, no one in the company would review it. I was free to do anything. I had the money to go any direction I wanted to go and this, this was a pursuit of curiosity. They were my very best days of science. It wasn't in a university. It was actually funded uh, by a mining company. It was a Broken Hill mining company and <clears throat> they um, realised that they needed people to be stimulated by curiosity because if you want to find a new mineral deposit, you find something strange out in the bush. You say, well, that's old. That's curious. And that's what drives yeah. exploration. That's yeah. what drives new mineral deposits. And they were smart enough to realise that curiosity drove science. I've never had that in a university. This is a party line. This is where you must go. Most of my funding in universities I gave up with the Australian Research Council uh, about or in about uh, the late 90s and all my research then was funded um, from outside the university. So 
um, the whole system now is driven by political policy and that's driven by politicians perceiving what is going to get them re-elected. So science now has been totally corrupted in my view. And what you're describing in a sense is actually the difference between you know, almost a socialist system and a free market system. The free market system with the mining companies, you are <laughs> free to innovate, engineer and get the answers, whereas this sort of uh, one uh, one one speed position that you're getting from from uh, you know from the university system is the the company line if you like or the <laughs> or the orthodoxy line but I mean that is sort of what we're seeing across the board I, I keep saying I think that what we're seeing is the rebirth of socialism in this country oh there's no doubt about that I mean for example uh, in the industry that I have worked in and now work in again is if I get things wrong three or four times and spend a big budget drilling holes and, and wasted money and found nothing. You get promotion. <laughs> but in a university, yeah. if yeah. you have a research yeah. program and you fail time yeah. and time again, yeah. uh, you actually put in a new application, you publish papers on what you've done, and you get promoted. Yeah. And and this is the difference. One, you live you you live by success. The other, you live by the number of papers you can publish. Now it's very, very easy to publish trivial papers. I've done it. Very easy. And I've only had one paper ever published, it was a pretty trivial one where there was not a single change the editors made to a comma or a full stop or anything. It's easy to do. And uh, once you know the system and once you know the, the, the way this journal operates and who the editors and reviewers are, it's so easy to get something published. And universities then rate you on the, how much you publish. They don't rate you on how much you've stimulated yeah. young people, yeah. how many careers you've built, how many people you've stopped from committing suicide. There's no way that, that you can be rated on that. Yet I have done that all my life. And, and the natural effect of all of this is that we're pushing towards, you know, this sort of, I mean, a cliff really in terms of the power grid in this country. We're, we're, <laughs> we're pushing towards this renewable-led future, which is a bit of a disaster. Um, I, where do you start with that? But uh, re <clears throat> renewables, the false profit, I mean, how would you describe? Well, the origin of renewables is that we are... Um, in a stage where we've abandoned Christianity. But we still have original sin, we have guilt, we have repentance, indulgences and absolution. And so we are sinning by putting this poisonous gas into the atmosphere, which just happens to be plant food. And we are sinning and therefore um, we need to repent. Uh, we buy our indulgences with high electricity prices and spoil the country with with. Um, solar panels all over great agricultural land or destroy the great scenery uh, with wind turbines and slice and dice birds and bats and kill whales when these things are offshore. That's not environmentalism. No. It's got nothing to do with environment. It's a new religion. But that new religion has arisen because no one has questioned vigorously the whole theory of climate change. Now, they're called renewables. They certainly are renewable. Because every time you put your hand out for a subsidy, it gets filled again with money. That's the only renewable thing about renewables. But wind and solar, you release more carbon dioxide in making that equipment than they save in their working life. Wind and solar use more energy to make them than they'll ever produce. Wind and solar don't go 24-7 um, and they don't have the grunt. Now, wind and solar have... Um, a great use, and that is a phone box right out in the outback or signals on the GAN railway line. Yeah. But apart from that, they don't have the grunt to run an industrial society. And it's a bit like um, our body where we have very large arteries near our heart and right in our toes we have capillaries. Now, the heart is where we generate the electricity and by the time it gets to you, the consumer, it's at the capillary. And that might be way out in the bush. Now, what we're doing is reversing that system. We're now putting these generating systems out in the bush because the city people are oh, so precious. We can't have wind turbines along the shorelines and in our parks and, uh, you know, we're so precious, but we do love our, our renewable energy. So what we're doing is we're now putting all these generating systems down at the toe to feed the heart, so we have to build a new grid. So we're building a parallel grid, but we've got to keep both grids operating because when wind and solar don't operate, We've got to use the original grid to pump the power down to the toe. So this is just madness. 
absolute madness. If you're looking down, and it's always hard to uh, use the crystal ball, but if you're looking into the crystal ball and we continue down this path of just using the bird choppers and the, and the solar panels, <clears throat> what does it look like in 20 years? Bankruptcy. Mm. We've seen it before. We had the Dutch tulip craze where yeah. in the 1600s uh, the Dutch were the wealthiest country in the world and they had a fad and this was uh, to collect tulip bulbs. And it was fashionable to have a tulip bulb, especially one that might produce a black tulip. People paid the equivalent of two years' salary to buy a bulb. And the inevitable happened. It all fell apart. And Holland went from the richest country in the world to one of the poorest. And that was because of absolute greed, fashion, fad, stupidity. We're going exactly the same direction. A great business to be in is the renewables industry because... You have got the government behind you, giving you subsidies. You've got the government squawking away. And what the government has done with bad policy is to create opportunities for the White Shoe Brigade to come in there and to make huge amounts of money, close down their coal-fired power stations. Uh, They don't care about reliable or unreliable energy. Keep the wind and solar going where they make more money. This has not been for the national good. It's not been good for the consumer. I think that's that is important because, I mean, I, I drove out to uh, Port Augusta last weekend and saw the array of bird choppers out there, the wind turbines. Blight on the landscape, as they are down in the, in the southern uh, part of the city. But So that's one aspect of it. You're right. Environmentalism. The environmentalists would never have put up with this 30 years ago. They would have, they would have been up in arms. But that's only one piece of the puzzle. The, the renewable sector, I, I want people to understand what it looks like and what it takes to get a solar panel from nothing to your, like, let's go back to the minerals that are required to be to use. Pe- people need to understand the, uh, the genesis of, the, of the, the so-called renewable industry. Like, what, what does it look like? What does it do to the planet? Well, firstly, with solar and then with wind. With solar, you have to convert silica, which is a very common mineral, quartz, into silicon. To do that, you need a huge amount of energy and you need to dope that silicon with a few other... Um, choice things like lead and cadmium and selenium and tellurium, and that is done in China. And that leaves a bit of a mess. And these solar panels uh, then come into Australia. They have a very short life. Um, They say 20 years, but it's probably closer to 15. And these solar panels are useless when there's pollen, spores, dust or snow on them, as Germany found. They just don't work when they're covered. And the second thing is that... um, In warm weather, you have to turn them off. And the reason for that is that you're converting sunlight into electricity and into heat. And in the hot weather, if you heat the panel even more, then it it decays very quickly. And so what happens is the silicon recrystallises and uh, it ends up decaying and the panel is useless. A good hailstorm will clean it out. So uh, solar panels will cover a huge amount of prime agricultural land and will leave toxins in that land like lead and cadmium and selenium. And yeah, so, so you don't know that. Explain that. They're leaching. Well, th- these are leached out. Every time you get rain on a solar panel, some of it leaches out. Now, these solar panels, um, you can partially recycle some, pa- some parts of them. In the case of wind, um, to start with a wind turbine, you need about 30,000 tonnes of iron ore, about 30,000 tonnes of concrete, To make concrete, you need to get limestone and shale, cook it up. Limestone's got 44% carbon dioxide in it. That carbon dioxide goes into the atmosphere. You sinter it, then you grind it up and you have cement. You've then got to quarry stone to make the aggregate to make your concrete. You've then got to transport that 30,000 tonnes just for the foundation for one turbine. So you use a lot of concrete to make a uh, a wind turbine. You use a lot of steel to make a wind turbine. But then you get into the, into the generator. Now, the generator uses a rare earth element magnets. We used to have magnets made out of iron. We then found it a bit better to have an iron cobalt magnet. We now find that magnets made out of rare earth elements are much better. Rare earth elements mainly come from a part of China, Bayan Ball, and that rare earth element ore is quite rich in uranium and thorium. I've been to Bayan Ulbo. It is probably the greatest environmental disaster of the world. The uranium and thorium material is just thrown everywhere. So if you're using wind-powered electricity, you are actually responsible for a huge amount of pollution by uranium and thorium in China. Oh, but they're Chinese. Let's not worry about that. You can't be an environmentalist. 
Now, that's in the magnets. We also have uh, cobalt in those uh, wind turbines, and that cobalt, most of it is mined by slaves who are children who are uh, working in dangerous open pits and underground in the Congo or Chinese group. So uh, if you want to support wind power, you're a supporter of slavery. The same as if you're supporting solar power. The solar panels are made by Uyghur slaves in China. So if you want to be supporting renewables, you're supporting slavery. You're supporting massive pollution of uranium and thorium. And then you look at the, the turbine blades, and they're made out of balsa wood laminated with epoxy. That balsa wood you get from clear felling parts of the Amazon forest to get your balsa wood. So, of course, you're a good environmentalist. Uh, you, you want to have renewable power. Bugger the Amazon. You just clear fell it and get the balsa wood. And then in the epoxies, there's a chemical, chemical called bisphenol A. That's incredibly toxic. Most countries in the world have banned the use of it. This comes out of China in the laminate um, turbine blades. Those blades cannot be recycled. Those blades are eroding all the time and spreading this bisphenol A everywhere in soils and waterways around the turbine blades. And then when the turbine blade has finished its useful life, which is much shorter than we're told, they get cut up and used as landfill. And so the bisphenol A gets into soil and gets into water. You cannot possibly be an environmentalist and support wind and solar power. The only reason for supporting wind and solar power is that it, the, it is a new invention where people can steal money via subsidies and high electricity prices. We've tried wind before, and the Dutch gave it up. Yeah. Um, there's much better ways of getting power. The, the, the other myth that all this, because I, I think these things are important to, to get out, uh, is that it's cheap, the renewable power. <laughs> take, take us through that and, and what it looks like without government subsidies, this sort of model. Well, that's a, that's a false lie, a mm. false argument. Mm. It's a lie. Uh, it, it's based on the fact that solar and wind are free. Well, they are. But then the cost of capital and the cost of infrastructure and the cost of replacement uh, is not. If you are to build a wind turbine... It'll probably last about 15 years. If you build a coal-fired power station, it lasts for 60 years. So you have to replace wind four times. The capital cost is enormous. The cost of maintenance are enormous because of the spinning and what is called um, brunelling, where you actually, um, with the wind direction changing, you, you spin and you erode bits of the shaft in different ways. Uh, the maintenance costs are horrendous. They're even more horrendous if it's offshore wind where you've got very uh, corrosive conditions. Um, the capital costs are high and the maintenance costs, maintenance costs are high and the environmental cleanup is high. But the most important thing is the environmental footprint of wind and solar is enormous compared with gas or yeah. nuclear or coal. Um, you are looking at thousands of hectares for every megawatt of wind power, whereas uh, for a gas turbine, you're looking at about the size of a quarter-acre housing block. Yeah. And so um, the environmental costs are not wound into that. The maintenance costs are not wound into it. The um, replacement costs are not wound into it. And the opportunity costs, where you are wasting capital, which you could be using elsewhere. So it's a false argument, but I, I'm not surprised it comes from the left because they've never understood money. That's <laughs> right. Um, and, of course, all of the meantime, we're shutting down coal-fired and gas-fired power stations in this country. China, I think, last year were building something like 92 brand Almost new... Almost two a week. Yeah, two building. a week. Yeah, so so this business about, uh, you know, because the theory would be we can do something in this country about it. We're 1% of the world's emissions. How has that been allowed to, that, that nonsense been allowed to, prop, you know, proffer out there in the community that we can somehow change that with our tiny drop in the ocean emissions, even if they're right about it in the first place, which we know they're not? Well, uh, they're not right. And secondly, they can't change it. And thirdly, if they're fair income, they would demonstrate in China. They yeah. would glue themselves to <laughs> Tiananmen Square. I keep offering. I keep offering to send <laughs> they, some they of my colleagues over there. They would have climate there. action now demonstrations <laughs> in Beijing. Mm. See how far you get. And what this is showing us is that in Western democratic countries, we are incredibly tolerant. We tolerate these people who are knowingly destructive yeah. of our economy, of property, of children's futures, yet we tolerate them. 
I'm not so sure we would. Now, we've got some wonderful examples of Western countries starting to act a little bit differently. There were some people in Germany that yep. glued their hands to the road. Well, the police cut out a bit of the road, so they got <laughs> a hunk of road hanging off their hands. There was a case where a group of demonstrators glued themselves to the floor, I think of a Volkswagen or Porsche sale room in Germany. And so the staff went home, turned off the lights, <laughs> turned off the central heating, and these people had the audacity to complain that the car sales room didn't provide them with toilet facilities while they were glued onto the ground. Yeah. Now, if they were so concerned about oil, then they would stay glued there because the solvent used to dissolve their hands on a painting or road that they glued themselves on are made from oil. Mm. So these people are showing uh, what I think is a twinge of, of mental illness. Yeah, and 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 it, you're absolutely right about that. It's uh, it's it's a, there's an interesting dynamic. I once heard it said that uh, this push into renewables was a bit like there was a, a bloke in the early part stages of the Eiffel Tower that had a, a parachute suit that that decided he was going to test it by jumping off the Eiffel Tower, and of course it didn't work, and he splattered on the ground. Um, that's a bit like what we're doing here. We've got this theory: it doesn't work, it's expensive, it's bad for the environment, and we're going to splat on the ground. Well, what we're doing is that. We are adding more and more wind and solar to the grid. Yeah. Now, the grid can't handle it, number one. And number two, doesn't matter whether you've got the whole country covered with wind turbines and solar panels. If the wind doesn't blow and it's night time, you're not going to generate any electricity. It yeah. doesn't matter how many you've got. And there have been um, figures done for the US, which per capita uses much more power than we do. Uh, but in the US, you would have to cover 70% of US farming land in wind and solar yeah. facilities yeah. to keep the US going on what is called renewable power. Well, that's lovely. You can turn the lights on, but there's no food to cook. Yeah, <laughs> so that's right. these people haven't thought it through. And rather than having a sober discussion, uh, you get denigrated. You get shouted at. Uh, these are angry people. Yeah. And we have now got social media, which has allowed a lot of unbalanced people to express their anger, a lot of people to show how dogmatic they are, the skills of critical thinking and analytical thinking and argument we have lost yeah. because it's not been taught to schools. Yeah. So in 180 characters in a Twitter um, rant, um, you can give an opinion. That's not an informed opinion. No. That's an unbalanced opinion. Yeah. And that's the world we've come to. And I... I get a lot of nutters wanting to criticise me, wanting to debate me, and unless they are suitably qualified and have been taught how to think, I won't deal with them yeah. because as soon as you talk to a nutter, 20 of them come back to you and life's too short. Mm. I'm, I'm mm. at the they stage of right. life where mm. uh, I just tell people to nick off. Yeah. I don't have time for that. I'm the last 20% of my life. Fair enough. Fair enough. I'm with you. Um, let's no, you're assume, not. You're not in the last 20% of your well, life. I might be. I might be. I haven't ventured outside today. There are people waiting for me. Um, let's assume for a minute, though, that it's – like let's assume that there is an issue uh, with carbon emissions and we can do something in this country, right? Let's park that for a minute as an assumption. There's a solution in the form of nuclear power – what does it look like? Is it is it because the the argument we hear from the left is oh no 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 it's not safe uh, it's not uh, it's not cost effective um, but we know it's carbon neutral. For me, just from where I sit, and I want to hear your views on it. But from where I sit, that builds the cat on the ideological ideological nature of this debate. It certainly does. Now, um, being too expensive, uh, I never ever believe the left when they talk about money. They don't <laughs> understand it. They waste money. They send countries broke every time they're yeah. in power. Um, yes, the capital costs are expensive. And why is that? Because of environmental lawfare that holds up a project for maybe 20 years. And that environmental lawfare frightens away capital or the cost of capital goes up, uh, the risk insurance goes up. So um, that's the false argument. The second thing is it's unsafe. Well, no, it's not unsafe. Uh, we had no one killed at Fukushima. We had no one killed at Three Mile Island. Uh, I'm not surprised that the Russians are having difficulty with their technology in the Ukraine war because that was shown uh, in in their uh, wonderful nuclear episode where they had a reactor um, uh, meltdown and they killed people. But that's due to a, a, a cultural stuff up and due to old equipment. Now, we're having countries like Finland saying we're going nuclear. We're having Sweden go nuclear. These were socialist countries. 
Even the socialists in Germany are saying we are going to go nuclear. Now, we almost went nuclear in this country. In 1969, John Gorton um, started to build a nuclear power station on Commonwealth land in Jarvis Bay, south of Wollongong. The foundations are still there to be seen. The dirty big um, heavy-duty road built in there is still there. Fishermen and surfers use that road to get to the coast. And he was rolled in April 1971 by Billy McMahon, who then put it on ice. And then when Labor came in in December 1972, they completely killed it off. We well, almost got there. If the, um, if the left of the Liberal Party hadn't rolled John Gordon, we would have had a 560 megawatt power station at Jarvis Bay providing electricity into the grid, into New South Wales, into the big industrial areas such as at Wollongong, which is only a little bit to the north. Um, but we've had nuclear power in this country for 60 years, and it's at Lucas Heights. And we're on to our second reactor there. The first uh, was the HIFAR, the second is the Opel reactor. And so if you've ever had cancer, uh, you will be using drugs made at Lucas Heights. And these are radioactive drugs. It was put close to the airport of Sydney, such as you can fly these drugs to the Pacific Islands or to Broome or Darwin and be treated. Um, since then, suburbia surrounded it and they're now complaining that there's a nuclear reactor nearby. But I first went there uh, as a school kid and uh, it was in the middle of the bush. So we've got trained people in nuclear. And this country is missing out on the greatest financial opportunity we could ever have. We could be the Saudi Arabia of um, nuclear, and this is the story. In this state, South Australia, we have um, two uranium mines, a third one will be reopening, and that uranium is converted into a uranium oxide or hydroxide called yellow cake, and we ship that off overseas. We ship off about 6,000 tonnes a year, and that yellow cake we could convert and beneficiate into enriched uranium. Enriched to about 2 to 5%. That's enough to run a reactor, but you need over 90% for a bomb. So it, it's not dangerous. Now, that enriched uranium, you then would create in South Australia fuel rods. You then lease these fuel rods to Korea and to Japan and, and to Europe, to Finland, to Sweden and to other countries that don't mine uranium, and you lease them. And when they got to the end of the life, you'd bring them back and they would pay you to clean that up and take out uh, the spent fuel and you would then release uh, it back to them. That spent fuel uh, is highly radioactive. You could possibly in the future use it again, so you've got to store it. And the best place to store it is in radioactive rocks. And the best place in my mind is at Radium Hill, which is in northeastern South Australia. It's on one station... Uh, and one station only, there's an old railway line that goes in there, Radium Hill was mined for uranium between 1906 and about 1962. Uh, there's a remnant of an old village there. You could store it deep down in that mine. Um, no one lives there. The nearest town is O'Leary. Uh, O'Leary has a population of four people. I know the whole town of O'Leary. I bet you don't know everyone in a single <laughs> town in your I, I would. I reckon I'm going to get up there. <laughs> this is how my votes. <laughs> and so um, O'Leary is the nearest town. It's on the Barrier Highway, which is the road from um, Sydney to, to, to Perth. It's on the Sydney to Perth railway line. It's the perfect place. It's yeah. isolated. Mm. It has got major infrastructure for carrying material and you could store the spent fuel there. So... In the 1980s, it was worked out that if we had a cradle-to-grave nuclear industry in Australia, then that would be $5,000 per annum per man, woman and child yeah. in this country. Yeah. And that is the greatest economic opportunity this country is faced with. We should in South Australia just grab this and run with it. Yeah. We produce the uranium. We've got an old deep uranium mine in the middle of nowhere. Well, not in the middle of nowhere. It's Tickalina Station. It's a lovely part of the world. Um but uh, we should grab it and run with it, and this would really enrich us. And South Australia then wouldn't be the poor man's state. It would be a wealthy state where um, civilised countries would be leasing our rods, giving us money to clean them up, and we would have this 
a perpetual money machine going forever. Yeah. That's just fantastic. Why don't we do it? Well, why don't we do it? I couldn't agree more. I spoke about it in my maiden speech. I've been talking about it for years. Um, the Scarce Royal Commission dealt with this, of course, here in South Australia, and it did some of the numbers now. Modelling, right, I'm with you. I'm not a fan of any modelling. But the, even on a, on a low-end scale, the numbers are eye-watering. We're talking about you know, uh, billions and billions of dollars of sovereign wealth funds so that next time we get hit with a pandemic, for example, or whatever you want to call it, we've got money there we don't have to print um, there are, as you say, the Saudi Arabia of the uh, of the South. Well, the scarce review was done before modular nuclear right. reactors right. were available. We've had them for since the 1950s in submarines and warships, but now that they're commercially available, and you could go, to, you can almost now go down to Bunnings and buy one and say, look, I'll have a Hitachi. Oh no, one, I'll have a General Electric. Have a new scale. Um, <laughs> or, so, no, 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 I'll have a Samsung. Um, you can buy these uh, and they are um, sealed. So that means that you have no access to any of the waste product and the builder of that, say with Rolls-Royce, would then take it back yeah. when the uranium has run out. Now, if you're running a big mine out in the middle of nowhere where you might need, say, 80 megawatts, uh, when the mine finishes, which they do, you put it on a B-double and you take it somewhere take else. It Why should we run a line? From Brisbane to Mount Isa, why don't we have a, a small um, a reactor there? I want to, I want to unpack that because that's really important. What, back to what you said about Chernobyl, and of course, you know, it's been said that that, that the technology that was being used in those days, Soviet technology from the forties and fifties, fifties, uh, is a bit like comparing, uh, you know, a, a, a sort of the Wright brothers plane to a modern, you know, seven four seven. Completely different. Completely bespoke. These plants in those days were kind of, oh, we'll put a bit here and I'll block this one in here. What we're talking about now with modular reactors are almost like buying an iPhone. It's just done one after the other, which means the safety is better, the checking is better, the systems are better, it's safer and cheaper. Um, And that is basically what we're seeing in submarines. So we're going to be getting small modular reactors in this country anyway, pretty soon when we get our eight subs, uh, whatever they turn out to be, Virginia class or whatever they are. So... People are slowly getting this. The, 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 the polling tends to suggest that people are getting more receptive to nuclear power. But really what we're dealing with now is low risk, safe and, uh, safe and effective. That's what it is. Well, if you're going to drive to an anti-nuclear demonstration, it is more unsafe driving than nuclear uh, facilities would be to your life. Um, it's like when you're flying in an aeroplane. I mean, I wouldn't have flown in a primitive Wright Brothers aeroplane. <laughs> but I often fly in modern jets. The un- most unsafe thing about me flying is driving to and from the airport. Mm, yeah. um, for the flying is very safe. It is the same for nuclear. Um, and we have had these wonderful improvements in technology over the years. Now, we often hear that, oh, this is old technology, you know, out with the old, in with the new. Well, if that's the case, Let's get rid of the wheel because yeah. the wheel is five and a half thousand years old. That's old technology. Let's get rid of the wheel. Yeah, now we can make square wheels. Yeah, see, yeah. see how you go with yeah, that? Yeah. So yeah. Um, we get a lot of false arguments that are raised and what we don't have is instant uh, – we, we, we are fighting instant propaganda through Twitter and Facebook and these mechanisms rather than dealing with contemplative thought. And everyone can have an opinion. Most of the time it's an ill-informed opinion but – uh, you can have an expert opinion, which is based on knowledge and experience, and that comes with time, and we're not using that with nuclear. If socialist countries like Finland and Sweden are happy to do it, why not us? So, and, and what is the reason, in your view, for this you know, political podcast? So let's just have a look at the politics of the demonisation of nuclear energy. Whenever we see it, we see the Simpsons and Blinky the Three-Eyed Fish, we see Chernobyl the... TV series that's on Netflix or whatever it is where there are people in masks and bio suits. There has to be a reason why this industry has been demonised so much. What is it in your view? I think it's been demonised by competing energy industries. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it's been demonised because we humans have evolved into living in such a safe environment. We don't have to look after over our shoulder for the monster that's going to come and get us. We don't have to worry about that any longer. We've got nothing more to worry about, yet we are hardwired uh, for trauma, which is why we have adrenaline. And so we've got nothing to worry about. And what we get worried about now are things we can't see. 
We cannot see x-rays. We cannot see radiation. We cannot see viruses. We cannot see bacteria. We cannot see carbon dioxide. So it's very easy to construct a fearful narrative about something we can't see and to exaggerate risks. Everything you do in life, uh, there is a risk. I very often go underground at Broken Hill. Uh, that is risky. But I tell you what, it's, it's far riskier driving from Adelaide to yeah. Broken Hill and back than mm. it is going underground. Yeah. Underground is safe and it's wonderful to be underground and hear the rocks creak and groan at you because you know that they're releasing stress. So uh, a lot of people are fearful of things. A lot of people have never been underground and they say, oh, I'm claustrophobic. I'm, you know, it's, you, how can you be claustrophobic in a drive that's five and a half by five and a half metres? This is, this is amazing technology we've got now. So the fear of the unknown is being exploited. We are so comfortable we can afford to waste, which we are doing, and we are so comfortable that we can um, spend a lot of time and money on things to pleasure ourselves and not worry about the future. I want to, I want to this is actually, I mean, we could just go on and on and on and forever. It's fascinating. But, but, I want, to, I want to put you in the position now of having uh, – you're the benevolent dictator of this country, and you'd be a very good one, by the way. I'd be very happy with that. Uh, and you have a magic wand, and you, are, and you are given an opportunity to fix the grid and save the country, to make Australia great again. What, what are you going to do from an energy point of view? Well, everyone has views of being king of the world. Uh, I'm, I'm no different. We all have benevolent dictator views. I'm at the right age to be a benevolent dictator <laughs> because – uh, I mean, the last 20% of my life, I'm not going to financially benefit from any scam I run. So I'm the perfect person. So vote for me, folks. Quite, quite benevolent. <laughs> um, in terms of energy, um, I would immediately cut subsidies and I'd say, I'd call them in and say, boys, the game's over. You know it was a scam. It's finished. Uh, I would build um, the high energy, um, low emissions coal-fired power stations where we have a lot of coal yep. and to put those stations close to the mine. So they'd be in um, Queensland and New South Wales. And I would also use gas because uh, at times when you've got a drought, you don't have enough water for cooling in coal-fired power stations, so you need another form of energy. I would also put in nuclear and I'd put in nuclear in the great industrial centres yeah. of our country. So they would be in Gladstone, um, Newcastle or in the Hunter Valley, in, in Wollongong, in, in uh, Wyala, Port Pirie, um, put them in Kalgoorlie up in the Pilbara. And these, uh, I'd have one or two of these very large, big grunt reactors, and have two um, gigawatt reactors, and then I'd have a, a fleet of mobile reactors that I can move for rural Australia. That saves you putting in a grid. That saves you maintaining a grid. And if towns die, which they do, or if towns grow, which they do, you can either reduce or add to the modular reactor. Yeah. I would also use wind and solar, and for decades I've seen wind and solar used in outback stations. It's the only way they can get power. Yeah. You can't justify having a one megawatt generator, a nuclear generator on an outback station. Yeah. You've got too much power and it's too expensive. And so uh, in this country, hydro is a bit difficult because we don't have the rainfall and we don't have the topography. I do a lot of work in Ecuador. You have a 4,000 metre topography. You have very, very high rainfall because it's at the tropics. And Ecuador, even in socialist times, was very, very sensible. All their revenues from oil, they put into building hydro systems, airports, universities and roads across ravines, which are just incredible. They're vertical walls, 200 metres down. It's incredible the infrastructure they built there. And electricity in Ecuador is four cents a kilowatt hour. Now, you could get Australia to that level. And once you have cheap electricity, right. you would have very, very uh, attractive situations for industry. And the last thing I'd do is I'd kill off the interconnectors between the states. And that means that if Queensland gets a DAPI government and says, oh, we're going to go uh, puerile and pure, fine. We're not going to give you any power for New South Wales or Victoria or South Australia. You're on your, lap, right. you're on your own. Right. If Victoria wants to kill off their brown coal, which is the cheapest electricity we've ever had in Australia, fine, do it. You're on your own. And we had once a situation where the states had their own grids and they competed for power. That's why South Australia under Sir Thomas Playford ended up getting a white goods yeah. and motor vehicle building industry because power was cheap and power was run by the state. 
So I, I would kill off the, the southeastern grid, the Australian energy um, grid system. I, I, might, I might keep a few inter- interconnectors hidden, hidden away in case there's a disaster. And um, if there's a disaster, you need to provide power. I'd also have some mobile uh, reactors on ships. Every now and then we get a Northern Territory or Eastern Queensland town wiped out by a cyclone. Park a ship in there that's got a, a nuclear uh, a small reactor on it and feed power into the town. Keep them alive until you get everything repaired. We have cyclones every year. Every third year or so we'll have Innisfail or Townsville lose power. Yeah. Fix it up. Yeah. Easy to do. So that would then complement what is absolutely necessary for this country is to have a large nuclear uh, power contingent in our military. And that's uh, for submarines and for warships. These are absolutely necessary. Uh, we are an island. We can't have cables going to next door bringing in power. Yeah. Uh, we don't have any borders where neighbours can say, oh, we're going to help you. We'll, we'll bring in our troops to help you. So if I were king of the world, I would attack the only thing that I think is important, and that is our energy systems. And that would lower inflation, that would increase employment, and that would make Australia. Uh, as a, a very wealthy country. Well, uh, on that note, you've got my uh, vote, uh, Professor Ian Palkou, President Ian Plymer. <laughs> El now, Presidente. El Presidente, <laughs> benevolent dictator of Australia, has now elected. Uh, please roll that plan I'm not out. elected. Well, I've, no, I've appointed need, myself. Well, well, you know, well, as part of your military coup, <laughs> we'll, we'll do it in that way if you want. No, that's fascinating. Thank you for thank you for stopping by. And, you, and the based podcast is what this is, and I can't think of anyone more based than you. So... Uh, There you go. Thank you for coming in. Thank you, Senator. And we will speak again soon. Thank you. Cheers.